Wow. Well, first of all, before I talk about what Franz has meant to me personally, uh, on a personal note, Franz, I do want to express my sense of personal betrayal by you. Some of you here know uh, we recently had a special convention to nominate a judge of probate candidate to fill an upcoming vacancy. Uh, we nominated former Mayor Henry C., who's here tonight, despite the fact that it's a cash bar. And <laughs> this is not how you told me it would be, from. See, in 2010, when Judge Sal Diglio was running on post, you organized an impromptu writing campaign for me on election day, and I finished second with eight votes. All along, you kept assuring me that there was case law on my side, specifically Vanessa Williams versus Burt Parks and the Miss America Corporation, that said, if Sal didn't finish his term for whatever reason, the first runner-up would claim the title. Well, you were wrong. All of these months of elocution and trauma lessons, not to mention letting you exfoliate me, complete waste of my time. Lord knows it's not the first time our fine plans didn't come to fruition. Let me take it back a decade to September 11th. Now, one of the th great things about a community like Camden is shared memories of milestones, triumphant or tragic. And I personally can never think of the events of 9-11 without thinking of France. And I'm not talking about 9-11 in 2001, by the way. I'm talking about 2002. <laughs> See, the town of Hamden organized a commemoration of 9-11 on 2002 at the Town Center Park. And Franz and I watched and cringed together. There was a poem read by a former fireman, truly great hand tonight, and an even better human being, and he's since passed away. I don't want to mention his name in case it seems like I'm making fun of his poetry, which yeah, I am. <laughs> so this gentleman solemnly read his 911 commemoration poem, which began with the stanza, at 8.48 o'clock, we all have got a really big shock. <laughs> Seriously, that's how the poem began. So, <laughs> and by the way, at that point, I quickly realized that poets should be poets, firemen should be firemen, and never the twain shall meet, but I guess I was the only one who got that message. <laughs> anyway, Franz turned to me, and I expected to hear his favorite barb about Ben public speaking, which is, there wasn't a dry seat in the house. He <laughs> turned to me and said, you know, we really need to contribute and work on next year's event. And I said, look, I don't think this is going to be an annual thing, friend. He said, oh yeah, we're going to need a one-year commemoration of this disaster. <laughs> Unfortunately, Franz was right. Turns out, the next year, someone was organizing a 9-11 motorcade. And this was Franz's time to shine. He decided to borrow, borrow military uniforms for himself and Joe McDonough, borrow a motorcycle and sidecar, and crash the parade. Now happily, because it never came to pass, this is one of those great creative ideas unsullied by the reality of poor implementation. <laughs> Another example that never quite came to pass, as Joe mentioned earlier, was Franz's almost service on the Legislative Council. Um, Due to a quirk in the redistricting laws, uh, I couldn't take a, I couldn't take off until inauguration day, and we had a vacancy to fill. To me, there was only one obvious choice to fill this role, and I emailed Franz, and he immediately grasped the situation. And I remember the email he replied to uh, me with. He said, "It's like when we when they appointed JFK's college roommate to fill the Senate seat until uh, Teddy turned 30. Count me in. How many broads do I get?" <laughs> Now, perhaps the funniest part of the whole episode was when Franz actually got nominated. The late Gloria Sandillo wisely, as she always was, expressed some reservations. Said, Are we sure about this guy? He seems a little erratic. And the former of the town chair said, oh, 100%, he'll do whatever we tell him. And as Gloria noticed us choking back laughter, she came up to me and said, as only Gloria would say, you guys are up to something, and it's pissing me off because I want in on the joke. <laughs> and yes, it is true that after the I want to spend less time with my family letter, the council president refused to schedule a vote on his nomination. Which apparently, his hands have hands have lost. We have a few. We've had a few bright ideas that we were able to pull off. We got a chance to record a one-minute radio ad that took about two hours for us to record because we kept ad-libbing. Every time we got to the end of a passable tape. 
Brown would yell out, kiss my grits for no good reason. <laughs> and then, as Joe mentioned, there was a time uh, I was being interviewed by a TV station about cleaning out housing. And the reporter asked me if I knew of a local resident, preferably a senior, who would appear on camera. Absolutely. Oh. So, you know, just the guy, I said, he's homebound. That's all the confused later in the day, but if we head over to I Street right now, we might just catch him. So they turned the camera on, and it got off to a rough start. He identified himself as, as uh, Sister Emily. <laughs> the reporter sort of looks at him, and then he said, don't judge, honey. It's no picnic getting old. <laughs> Surprisingly, he gave a great and rational soundbite before, as Joe mentioned, abruptly stopping mid-sentence and saying, it's time for my evening to pay. <laughs> he then walked inside. As I stood with the news crew in his driveway, forgive anybody with a sensitive ear, the reporter turned off the microphone, turned to me and said, what the fuck was that? <laughs> The Little Pizza Ship Statue. <laughs> this is one of France's most famous escapades, and I'm here to say tonight, or in any court of law, under oath, I wasn't part of it. <laughs> um, and for tonight, it shall be known as the Little Pizza Chef Statue. Statue. The Little Pizza Chef Statue. Try saying that five times fast and see how 